The citric acid cycle is a very important cycle because it's the center of aerobic respiration. It's basically the cycle where all our fuel molecules, the carbon-based fuel molecules such as amino acids and fat molecules and glucose molecules actually end up going. And this is where we extract the high energy electrons from these carbon fuel molecules and use those electrons on the electron transport chain to actually generate the high energy ATP molecules that are needed by the cell to carry out many different types of processes such as contraction of our skeleton muscle cells. Now, because the citric acid cycle is so important, we actually have to regulate this citric acid cycle. We have to closely monitor its activity. In fact, even before the citric acid cycle actually begins, one point of regulation of the citric acid cycle is by regulating pyruvate decarboxylation. Because remember, pyruvate decarboxylation must take place before the citric acid cycle actually begins. So, in the cytoplasm of our cells, the glucose is transformed into pyruvate via glycolysis and under certain circumstances, the pyruvate can even be transformed back into glucose. Now, if we have plenty of oxygen in our cell and our cell wants to produce ATP molecules, the pyruvate will enter the matrix of the mitochondria and in the matrix, the pyruvate will be transformed via an irreversible step into acetyl coenzyme A. And what this step does is it commits the acetyl coenzyme A, the derivative of pyruvate, into one of two different pathways. We either commit the acetyl coenzyme A to undergo the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, or also known as tricarboxylic acid cycle, to generate those NADH molecules and FADH2 molecules to basically form ATP via the electron transport chain. Or under other conditions, the acetyl coenzyme A can be committed to a second pathway that produces lipids. And we'll talk more about that in a future lecture. So we see that the pyruvate decarboxylation process is a very important step, very crucial step in glucose metabolism because it essentially commits that glucose derivative molecule, the pyruvate, into carrying out the citric acid cycle or in some cases lipid synthesis. Now, one way by which the cells can actually regulate this pathway is by regulating the enzyme that catalyzes this step. So remember, pyruvate decarboxylation is regulated by an enzyme complex known as pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And this actually consists of three different types of proteins, three different types of enzymes. We have E1, E2, and E3. Now, E1 is also known as pyruvate dehydrogenase. E2 is also known as dihydrolipoyl acetyl uh, transacetylase. And E3 is known as dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase. And these three enzymes are found within this complex and they catalyze different steps of pyruvate decarboxylation. Now, let's suppose in our cell we have plenty of ATP molecules. And if we have plenty of ATP molecules, that basically means we're going to have plenty of intermediate molecules that are used to actually produce those ATP. So we're going to have high levels of NADH and acetyl coenzyme A. And under such conditions, the acetyl coenzyme A will act as an allosteric inhibitor. It will bind onto the E2 component of this complex and that will inhibit the activity of that complex. Likewise, NADH is also an allosteric inhibitor to the complex because it binds onto the E3 location of the complex, also inactivating its ability to actually catalyze this pyruvate decarboxylation step. Now, in addition to these uh, regulatory pathways in eukaryotic cells, such as the cells of our body, we also have another important regulatory method. We actually use a type of covalent modification, namely phosphorylation, to actually regulate the activity of this complex. So, in eukaryotic cells, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is controlled via phosphorylation, a form of covalent modification.
So let's study this diagram for just a moment. So this is our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex in its active form. And notice it is not phosphorylated, but under certain conditions, we have a kinase that is actually attached onto the E2 component of the complex. This kinase is stimulated, and we'll see what stimulates it in just a moment. It is stimulated to transfer a phosphoryl group from ADP, uh, from ATP onto the E1 component of the complex, and that essentially forms this phosphorylated state, and that inactivates the activity of E1. So remember the E1 component of the complex actually catalyzes step one and step two of pyruvate decarboxylation. It, it essentially stimulates, the E1 stimulates oxidative decarboxylation of pyruvate into that acetyl component to ultimately form that acetyl coenzyme A. Now, once we form this phosphorylated state, it is no longer active, but under certain circumstances, we can inactivate the kinase and activate another molecule known as a phosphatase. So remember, phosphatases are enzymes that reverse the effects of kinases. They can use water to hydrolyze those bonds, releasing that inorganic phosphate and reforming this initial state of the molecule. And so in this state, the enzyme is active and can catalyze pyruvate decarboxylation. So we see that the complex basically moves back and forth between the active and the inactive state. And this is the major method by which the cells of our body actually regulate pyruvate decarboxylation and in turn regulate the citric acid cycle. Now, what types of conditions actually favor this state and what types of conditions actually favor this state? So, let's suppose we're in a skeleton muscle cell and in that skeleton muscle cells, we are at a resting condition. So what that means is, we're not contracting those skeletal muscle cells, and so they're not using ATP molecules to actually generate those contractions of the actin myosin filaments. <coughs> And under such conditions, we're going to build up our ATP concentration. We're going to have a high energy charge value. Remember, the energy charge basically tells us the relative concentration of ATP. And if the energy charge is high, we're, we're going to have a high concentration of ATP in our cell. Now, if we have plenty of ATP molecules, we're also going to have plenty of intermediate molecules that help us produce those ATP. So things like NADH and acetyl coenzyme A will also have a high concentration in the cell under resting conditions. And because on the rest of the conditions, we don't actually want to produce any more ATP molecules from the glucose, we want to conserve that glucose, what our cells will do is they will actually inactivate pyruvate decarboxylation. How? Well, these acetyl coenzymes A, the NADH molecules, and the ATP molecules can actually stimulate the kinase attached onto the E2 to phosphorylate the E1 component of the complex. And what that does is it transforms the molecule from the active state into the inactive state. And now pyruvate decarboxylation will not take place. And that means we will conserve the glucose molecules in our body and we will not produce any more ATP molecules. So once again, to summarize, let's take a look at this diagram. So in the mitochondrial matrix, we have pyruvate, which is transformed into acetyl coenzyme A via pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And this is the committed step. Once we form acetyl coenzyme A, it will be fed into the citric acid cycle where we produce the NADHs and FADH2s. And those high energy electrons on these molecules will move onto the electron transport chain on the inner membrane of the mitochondria to form those high energy ATP molecules. But under resting conditions, 
We don't want to generate these ATP molecules because we already have lots of these ATP molecules to begin with. And so we want to turn off this pathway. And one way by which we turn off this pathway is by inhibiting pyruvate dehydrogenase complex from committing this molecule into the citric acid cycle. So we see that the kinase phosphorylates this, inactivates this enzyme, and that prevents this reaction from actually taking place. Now, let's, uh, let's suppose we switch the argument. Let's suppose now our cells are contracting. And if the cells are contracting, we are using up ATP molecules and our energy charge value in the cell will drop. And if the energy charge value drops, we're going to have a relatively high concentration of molecules such as ADP. And the, ATP, and the ADP adenine diphosphate will actually go on and inhibit that activity of kinase. In addition, pyruvate will also inhibit that activity of kinase and the kinase found on the E2 component will no longer phosphorylate that pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Now, just because we're no longer phosphorylating this molecule doesn't actually mean the molecule will spontaneously go back into this state. We actually have to activate the phosphatase. Now, what activates the phosphatase to reverse these effects of the kinase? Well, it's the calcium. So remember, in contracting muscles, when we contract our skeleton muscles, what happens is, the calcium that is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum will be released into the cytoplasm. And the calcium is not only used to actually contract those actinomycin filaments, but the calcium is also used by this enzyme here. When there is a rise in calcium concentrations in the cytoplasm of the skeleton muscle cells, there's also a rise in calcium levels in the matrix of the mitochondria. And that calcium will go on and stimulate the phosphatase to actually dephosphorylate this molecule, use a water molecule to hydrolyze this bond releasing that inorganic orthophosphate and activating our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and that will stimulate this process. It will basically continually transform the pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A and that will commit the molecule to undergo the citric acid cycle which is ultimately used to generate ATP molecules along the proteins of the inner mitochondria along, uh, along that electron transport chain. So this is how we basically inhibit or activate the activity of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Now, the final thing that I'd like to focus on is how there are certain cells of our body which also respond to hormones and these hormones essentially stimulate or in some cases don't stimulate the activity of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So let's focus on epinephrine and insulin. So epinephrine is basically released by our body when we're under stressful situations. So for instance, when we're trying to run away from some type of scary animal, for instance, a bear. And as we're running away, we want to produce lots of ATP molecules to allow the skeleton muscles to actually contract. And what will begin to happen is the epinephrine molecules will bind onto liver cells that will initiate a specific type of signal transduction pathway. So remember that epinephrine binds onto the beta adrenergic receptor of liver cells and that stimulates epinephrine signaling and that ultimately produces a, a calcium ions. And the rise in calcium in, in, inside the cell what that basically does is it stimulates the phospho it stimulates the phosphatase molecule and the phosphatase basically hydrolyzes this bond and transforms the inactive molecule into its active state and once this is activated will produce plenty of acetyl coenzyme A molecules needed to produce ATP so we can continue running away from that scary animal our bear <clears throat> now, insulin. So following a meal that's, let's suppose, rich in carbohydrates, we're going to see that our blood glucose level will rise. 
and liver cells and other cells of the body will try to maintain that glucose level. So liver cells will respond to insulin by basically activating that phosphatase and activating this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex so that ultimately all those glucose molecules that are absorbed by the liver cells can be transformed into acetyl coenzyme A and we can produce those ATP molecules. Now, in other cells of the body, for instance, adipose cells, so fat cells, the insulin can also affect these fat cells to actually indirectly stimulate the phosphatase to activate the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to actually produce many more of these acetyl coenzymes A because in these fat cells, the acetyl coenzyme A are precursor molecules that are used to actually synthesize lipid molecules.